zombies. We've all seen the movies. We've all heard the stories. Shuffling mounds of rotting flesh relentlessly pursuing innocent young teenage girls. Putrescent meat with a single-minded purpose. To kill and eat the living. Zombies are a menace to society. The undead are in league with the devil, and they're an abomination before the Lord. I heard they come into your home at night and eat your brains. There are some who are using all the tools of the 21st century to shed new light on this important issue. The undead are terribly misunderstood creatures. But what do we really know about the zombie race? Join us now as we look into the way of the dead. <laughs> examine zombies in history and their role in modern society. What are they? What do we really know about them? Where do they come from? And above all, are they a threat? Zombies are a constant threat to the human race. Make no mistake, it's us or them. And I'm going to do my darndest to make sure that it's them. This man appeared in our film on the condition he remain anonymous for fear of a zombie attack. His name is Max Brooks. He lives in Brooklyn, and he is the author of The Zombie Survival Guide. It is impossible to be too careful, too prepared, too vigilant. Zombies are relentless. They do not sleep, they do not eat, and they do not get tired. Once a zombie locates its prey, it will not stop until it has been fed or has been destroyed. But is that our modern scientific understanding? There are those in the scientific community with different ideas. I have personally researched every recorded attack in the historical literature, and every one is a textbook case of self-defense. There are some hate mongers posing as scientists. They have proven themselves to be idiots. There isn't even a consensus about what causes zombieism. Zombieism is caused by a virus called solanum. I think they definitely um, have a bloodline or a um, virus. Solanum travels through the blood from the site of the attack to the brain. The virus then uses the cells of the frontal lobe for replication. The heart is stopped and the infected victim is rendered dead. See, I think that there's like these worms that are underground in the park that have a virus. But. The brain remains alive as it mutates into this completely new organ, the most critical new trait of which is a complete independence from oxygen. The brain is now independent of the body, and this makes the zombie invulnerable. The body can be shot, burned, frozen, buried in tar, and the zombie will still survive. And they're like infecting it with this like plagiarism, this bad plague that is the, that's a vortex here. Unfortunately, solanum is 100% communicable and 100% fatal. If you get bitten, you will get infected, and you will turn into a zombie. In a little less than a day, you are one of them. The infection process is quite gruesome. Once a victim is bitten, there is no way to save him. After about an hour, the infected area becomes incredibly painful and turns a sickly brown purple. After about five hours, the victim will have a high fever and experience dementia, vomiting, and acute joint pain. Symptoms may also include incredibly disorienting hallucinations. As three more hours pass, the extremities and infected area will go numb. Fever will rise, dementia will increase, and the victim will lose coordination. When 16 hours have passed, a deep coma. When 20 hours pass, the heart and brain will shut down. Then, at the 23rd hour, the culmination of the event. Reanimation. Through its ravenous hunger, the zombie will now spread its plague from victim to victim 
until all have fallen under its curse. So-called zombieism is not a virus. It is not a. It's not a disease, as many would have you believe. It's merely a condition. The brain, realizing that it has been bitten, is convinced that it is time to die. All bodily functions are systematically shut down, in much the same way that Tibetan monks can slow their heart rate in breathing. Once this is done, the brain realizes that it does not need these systems, this bloodstream, these organs. The brain realizes that it is perfectly well off without nourishment and oxygen. Thank you very much. This not quite dead state is actually an improvement in many ways. One does not need to sleep. One does not feel pain, heat, or cold. One can live in virtually any environment one wants. In fact, it's a theory of mine that the living impaired try to bite us, not out of any malicious intent, but only to try and help us, to bring us over to their way of life, which is so much more enjoyable. Everyone is always trying to convince everyone else of their point of view after all, no? Ah, thank you, Reginald. Virus, disease, condition, we may never know. But, are the living impaired still dangerous? Are they a menace, or merely trying to make their way through life, same as everyone else? Anyone who says zombies can be tamed or cured is full of sh Now, this condition does have some drawbacks, of course. Speaking and motor functions are severely inhibited. However, it's my opinion that the undead are perfectly fit for everyday life. Reginald has been my trusted assistant for 15 years, and I've rarely had a serious problem. A friend. Oh, that's right, Reggie. Friend. I've been dead for 10 years, and I have never bitten anyone while at work. Well. I done be using them on this pig farm since about uh, 1992. They're very cooperative workers. Once you get used to the smell. They are moral people. No different from you or me. I just wish everyone were more understanding. I love and trust my husband. Oh, I love you too, honey. After the incident, there was a hard rehabilitation period for both of us. But thanks to some rigorous speech therapy, I can speak perfectly normally. I do still have to keep him away from our pets, and we have to be careful with dinner guests. W what dinner guests? Well, I can't help it if they don't like my cooking. You seem to like it. Here you go, honey. Oh, thank you, honey. Mm -hmm. Enjoy. I have no sense of taste, dear. <laughs> anyway, we've adjusted quite nicely to this new way of life. Let's see now. It was our ninth anniversary trip. Tenth, dear. It was our tenth. Right. We were at the Canary Islands. We took a trip to a private island, uh, one of the smaller islands. We were just sitting on the sand when this strange man stumbled up out of the water, spitting water and groaning. At first he didn't notice us and instead stumbled off towards the hotel in the distance. Well, suddenly one of his fingers fell off. I, I wasn't surprised. I, I'm in business. I see funny things all the time. I just thought he was drunk. So I handed him his finger. He gazed absentmindedly at it for a few seconds. Then he lunged towards me and bit my hand. We really didn't think much, in, much of it until the next day when I died. Then we thought something was wrong. It took a lot of hard work, but I already had very good vocabulary skills before I died, so I was able to make almost complete recovery. When Rob first came to me, he'd lost all of his speech function. All he could do was moan a little bit. So we started with the basics. Mm -hmm. Eventually, at the end of one year, Rob was progressing just beautifully. Cat. Cat. 
Very good. He was so eager to make progress. He loved showing off what he could do at the end of every lesson. I once caught him reciting his alphabet with a dead squirrel. After a few more years, he could have educated conversations with a five-year-old. Moses supposes his toeses are roses. I do believe that's bad grammar. It is. You're right. Let's not do it. And now he's able to function almost normally. <laughs> almost. But is it really as safe as it seems? Our son Livingston is eight. We named him after the man who wrote the screenplay for the first Star Trek movie. Of course, he wasn't born living in Paired. Well, haven't your children ever looked so cute you could eat them alive? Livingston is just like his father. He loves to learn. He's very, very tactile. His vocabulary isn't quite to the level of his father yet, but we're working so very hard on it. Last month, we started colors. We're also making great strides in Livingston's diction and enunciation. And I hope that soon we'll be moving on to words with more than one syllable. Use your words, dear. Livingston is working hard, and we're very hopeful that he'll make a full recovery. Oh yeah, when I was in school, everybody learned about the zombie threat. I remember watching film strips to learn how to defend myself. Zombies could attack at any minute of the day. Of course, how do you know when the zombie apocalypse is coming to your neighborhood? Well, John and Mary know. Be on the lookout for suspicious reports on the television. Look for words like massacre, rivers of blood, government conspiracy, medical emergency, school closings, Barbara Streisand. So what do you do once you know that the undead are coming? That's right, Mary. Lock all your doors and windows. Say goodbye to your pets as well. They'll just be a nuisance later on. Once you have secured your house, collect all the food and water you can. Be sure to collect nourishing and healthy foods like fruits and vegetables. Bring plenty of water as well. weapons out and make sure they're functional. But wait a minute. How do I know what kind of weapons to use against the living dead? Good question, Johnny. When picking a weapon, ask yourself these questions. Can it crush a skull in one blow? If not, can it decapitate in said number of blows? Ah, but wait. Is it easy to handle? Is it light? Is it durable? A crow 
bar. Good choice, Johnny. And always remember, blades don't need reloading. Now, you're ready for some serious zombicide. Uh-oh, what's that noise? It looks like the zombies have found your house. Quick, barricade that door. Too late. It looks like you'll have to fight. When killing the undead, remember, the only way to stop them is by removing their head. So always remember, Johnny, duck and sever. Good job, Johnny. Now quick, grab your supplies and get up those stairs. Most zombies can still crawl upstairs, so after you're up, destroy the staircase behind you with a stick of dynamite. Uh-oh, it looks like you left Mary downstairs. It looks like she's been bitten. Oh well, it's too late for her. Bye, Mary! So now you're safe, right Johnny? Well, not exactly. Remember, no place is safe, only safer. And of course, once they found you, their moans will only attract more of them. And what did you forget, Johnny? That's right, earplugs. The zombie moans will continue until they catch you. So unless you think you can sleep with a dozen zombies moaning all around you, you'd better be prepared for a tough uphill psychological battle. My, my, Johnny. You don't look so good. Oh well, at least you know what you'll do differently the next time zombies attack. The living impaired are exceptionally good at doing monotonous, repetitive tasks which they do not find boring in the slightest. If we can get the dead to, to do the, the, the dirty jobs, that's great. A few living impaired have even been trained to do more specialized work. I was once sent some footage that appeared to be an attack. There are people with their intestines being torn out. In fact, it is only a recording of living impaired surgeons performing an appendectomy. School, jobs, appendectomies? Not what we think about when we think of the living impaired. Can this really be possible? Can our children go to school with the undead? Can we work alongside the living impaired? I've been doing this job for five years now, and my boss refuses to even consider me for a promotion. I think it's shameful the way people don't actually recognize the potential that we have to offer. They don't realize that we can fulfill useful functions in society. They're taking jobs away from kids who need them, from people who need them, from the Hispanics across the border. They're losing their jobs to zombies. What are we going to do about that? They don't need no food, no water. They work for free. They work 24 hours a day. How are you doing, Frank? They don't like to talk much while they're on the job. Before the incident, I was the CEO of a pharmaceutical company. They actually kept me on after the incident, but after a few years, they noticed a deterioration in my performance and my body. And then they had to let me go. Now he works at the IRS. Well, after someone dies, obviously they stop aging, you see. So although Livingston is really 16, he still resembles an eight-year-old, and we treat him as such. So my little boy will be eight forever. 
in particular when we're working with children, we work very hard with physical activities to improve their fine as well as their gross motor skills. So Livingston's therapy includes things like walking and playing ball, all kinds of interesting things that young zombies love. third grade for the last four years. He has some trouble making friends. He has problems with communication, and when somebody teasingly calls you a numbskull or a deadhead, he takes it personally. You see, it hurts so much more when it's true. But this issue goes far beyond the office and the classroom. There is a darker, deeper side to this controversy. How is mainstream America reacting to the living impaired in society? Does the normalization of the undead undermine everything this country stands for? This is Ames Jobson, the head of a group that has made it their mission to stomp out zombieism in society. Christian values that have been the backbone of this country ever since its inception! This is our duty as American patriots. And what it means is that we cannot allow marriage between living men and women and the undead. Well, the Federal Marriage Amendment would define marriage in the United States as exclusively a union of the living man and the living woman. So-called um, mixed vitality marriages, if you will, would be illegal, which I believe is entirely appropriate. Marriage in the United States shall consist only of the union of a living man and a living woman. Neither this Constitution nor the Constitution of any state shall be constructed to require that marriage or the legal incidence thereof be conferred upon any union other than the union of a living man and a living woman. How do you feel about the undead marriage amendment? there's no difference between traditional couple and a mixed vitality couple is like saying there's no difference between table salt and rat poison. The American Center for Lifeless Unions was started in 1995 by myself and my late husband George. He and I continue to run all of the center's activities to this day, joined by a dedicated staff and supported by over 50 members and volunteers nationwide. Originally, we had one very simple goal. We wanted to change the wording of the traditional marriage vows. I, Belle, take you, George, to be my husband, to have and to hold, for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in death, to love and to cherish, from this day forward until whatever. Obviously, since then, we have had to face a much more serious threat. Mixed vitality marriages will undermine the family-friendly, old-fashioned values that have made our country what it is today. Now, the Bible clearly stands against necrophilia as being unclean and sinful, and so tolerance of mixed vitality couples is tolerance of the unclean and sinful, and therefore tolerance of the devil. Rational thought is not concerned with the love of zombies, you know. Somebody <laughs> wants to make love to a zombie, that's all right. When a society walks hand in hand with the devil, the only outcome can be death and destruction of the world as we know it. The very idea that a marriage between the living and the living impaired is a threat to the fabric of our society is ridiculous. I spend most of my day trying to hold together the flesh of my husband, and those same strategies can be used to hold together the fabric of society. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't dated any zombies myself, um, but I mean, I, I would if, if, um, if I met a zombie, or, <laughs> sorry, uh, living dead that, um, that, you know, really, really tugged it at my heart, and, but... Would you uh, go out with this man right here? Um, he has a really good job. Hi. 
Um, sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, hi. The popularity of zombieism in recent years, especially among the American youth, has spread along with the growing tolerance of necrophilia and mixed vitality relationships. It is going to take a 180 degree turnaround in the hearts and minds of the American people and a complete rejection of the mixed vitality way of life before this penance is checked. Praise God, can I get an amen? Amen. The statistics show that more than 50% of marriages end in divorce. The way we see it, almost all marriages end in divorce, if you count marriages that end when the husband or the wife dies. We are working hard to change that. What about the words we use? What does that say about who they are in our society? Kite, wop, jap, Frenchman? Well, the words zombie fade from polite usage as easily as those words did. When I was a kid, they were zombies. I mean, they're zombies. They're undead, right? They wander around. They're not, they're not living in paired. They're damn zombies. Even the word zombie is something that feeds the hate mongers. Zombie implies stumbling around, eating people's brains, like in a cheesy Hollywood movie. Well, we don't all do that. Do you have any idea how hard it is <laughs> For me to walk down the street and, and have people yell Z zombie at my husband? Excuse me. Thank you. Z is not an obscenity. That's just the liberal media's way of kowtowing to z causes. Even if it were an obscenity, it would be an appropriate name for such an obscene, unnatural, disgusting practice are not the victims here. The victims are the people who wake up one morning to find that their neighbors gnawing on their scapulas. And stop bleeping me! Are the living impaired eager to rejoin society? And how far are they willing to go to fit into society's norms? There are still living impaired societies in Louisiana. Societies which still practice the traditional methods, if you will, but most live normal lives. Our forefathers designed the United States to be a bastion of freedom in the face of tyranny. Yes, but they also designed it as a righteous example to the rest of the world. In a time when deism and atheism were rampant, they saw fit for this country to found this country on God-honoring principles. And the role of the United States is still well, the same today. We see zombieism as a choice. It's something that people will choose to embrace. Now, perhaps it's out of vitality-related confusions or um, even a negative experience in their childhood. A man might turn to an undead lifestyle because his father, his father was always very cold, stiff, and um, unresponsive. He embraces the undead lifestyle subconsciously as a way to reconcile himself with his father. But whatever the reason for his decision, the fact remains that it was indeed a choice. And as such, it can be reversed with um, proper uh, counseling and uh, levels of medication. Well, almost all the graduates of this program here at the Family Focus Vitality Challenge Correction Institute go, to, go on to lead um, healthy, fulfilled lives and engage in normal relationships. Uh, now, of course, they will always carry a vestigial zombie-like appearance, but they will be cured. Family Focus Scheiser, cures for cocked. What are they talking about? Who says they need to be cured? Listen, reports that our methods are too extreme are founded entirely on misinformation. Yes, some of our patients experience slight confusion, such as calling something or someone the wrong name, or remembering incidents that never actually happened, but uh, that confusion does fade over time. In nearly all cases, it never seems to impede the patient's ability to lead a normal life. Tom Cruise is, an, is a successful graduate of our program. Now, except for his problem with uh, calling our Zobmi recovery program uh, Scientology and referring to me as, um, what was it? Uh, yes, L. Ron Hubbard, 
he's completely cured. We try to distance ourselves from organizations like Family Focus. Those people would try to change who Rob is, not help him in his present state. And they're dangerous, right, honey? Uh, 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 yeah. Turning aside from the moral issue, is it really as safe as it seems? Are there really any dangers? Well, they see brains as a source of nourishment rather than as the amazing thinking tools that God designed them to be. Brains are a wonderful gift from God, but using them for eating rather than thinking will lead to the way of the devil. The living impaired mean they have an eating disorder as a result of severe deep depression, the cause of which is, no doubt, their ill treatment by humans. Don't you eat too much when you're depressed? Most modern living impaired, however, have completely given up eating human flesh. I have even had the chance to meet several vegan living impaired. And many studies have shown the negative effects of um, moaning, especially on young children and the elderly, and those who suffer um, respiratory conditions like asthma. But in the necrophile community, moaning is actually promoted as healthy, normal activity. Well, study after study has shown that moaning causes decreased brain activity and even death of the brain cells. And it's been linked to severe deadly types of cancer. Secondhand moaning creates serious risks for your health. The zombie moan is merely an instinctual response to finding a victim, but it is also a potent weapon in and of itself. The moan is also a psychological weapon, capable of driving the haunted insane after incessantly listening to it for days and nights. Frankly, the way that living impaired cultural music is disparaged is shocking. <laughs> How rampant is the discrimination against the living impaired? Are they accepted by their family and friends? My family has cut me off completely. Then what about you? I don't think my family's noticed. Oh, honey, do you want your other finger? It's in the freezer. No, I think I'll do it fingerless this time. Of course, we'd love to have more children. And God knows we've tried. <laughs> <laughs> There are some medical problems. We were thinking about adoption, but it's a little hard to meet the adoption criteria. It's obviously discrimination. These people are incapable of seeing that underneath this skin... <laughs> I'm the same as everybody else. They obviously won't let me adopt a child because I don't make enough money, and it's wrong. We are also working with the NAAC, the National Association for the Advancement of Corpses, to forward the cause of L.I. rights in all aspects of life. No one should lose her job just because she isn't alive anymore. There are people out there who don't think that the L.I. are people and don't deserve the same rights as everyone else. This is no different from Nazi Germany or slave owners in the American South. Whenever a group is being attacked, the first thing people say is that they aren't human. When we let freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, living and dead, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that old Negro spiritual, Zombie at last, zombie at last, thank God Almighty we are zombie at last. citizen, the old world zombie has become the living impaired. Only time will tell what the future may bring. I'm Daniel Nesbitt.
doctor and he still can't figure it out. Turning aside from the moral issue, is it really as safe as it seems? Are there really any dangers? Are there zombies in our society? Oh, definitely. They're all over the place. Where do you find them? Well, it, it depends. There are some in our government. Yeah. That's true. Ever had a relationship with a zombie? With a zombie? Um, not really a relationship, but I, um, I did see a vampire. Action. Flashed a camera. What a hard. <laughs>